30. The Children of Rassilon. The periodic subdivision of archaic Gallifreyan history known as the Old Time is an area of much debate. The scribe Quartinian theorises that the age of the Pythias should be divided into two sections, the time of empire, which then decayed terminally through the time of chaos. One extreme had to be reached, its nadir plumbed before a new order could assert itself. Once the darkness was complete, only Rassilon could light the new lamp, but the flame would gutter dangerously for a long time. From Rassilon the Good, Pridonian Cardinal Berusa. A tongue of flame leapt from the abyss and touched her cage. There was a gasp from the assembly of lords and councillors in the cavern, but the Pythia was unscathed. Only in her mind were there real flames. Veil had burned away the cords that she had woven, the threads that united them, that bound him to her. The anger that compelled him had finally consumed him. How wasteful. Now she was alone. Their eyes were all on her. One name, they thought. That was all they wanted. A tiny boon so that their teetering empire would go on forever. She gave a deep groan. She owed them nothing. The world tasted of dust. She felt her age for the first time. Her hands were only mottled skin, stretched across brittle bone. Her world was corrupting. The people squirmed like maggots on the filthy accumulation of Gallifrey's past. The eye of the Sphinx began to weep. The great tears of the cat rolled down the Pythia's gilded face. It wept for the age that passed with the coming of the future. The Pythia's remaining eye stayed dry as ice. My successor, where is he? she cried. Where? Figures scurried in alarm below. She heard drums beating outside and the distant fizz of council police guns. Hanstrong stood by the stair with his ceremonial sword raised. There was the crash of overturned icons in the temple above. The future had rejected her. Now she would take revenge upon its snub. Sisters, my sisters, she called to them alone. This world is doomed. I curse it. As I die, so shall it wither. Go now, my followers, and flee this world. Seek out the fire mountains of Khan. There you shall endure forever. The gods shall protect you in their cupped hands. She gripped the weave of her basket and cried aloud, Let the world hear my curse. I am Gallifrey, sky and rock, flame and flood, womb and bone. When I am no more, the world shall be barren and empty of new life. It will live a slow, ageless death and come to nothing in its own dust. I have spoken these words. Let them be fulfilled. From her robe she pulled an ancient sacrificial blade. She reached up and cut the umbilical rope that held the basket. It plunged into the abyss and there was silence. Lord Doubtroyal gathered his papers and left the temple. But she gave no name, my lord, called one of his secretaries, scampering to keep her pace. There is no successor. She said he, proclaimed his lordship. A man, my lord, surely not. Did she speak any other name? He will suffice. She foresees the future, but who says it has to be propitious for her? The Empire's just been spared a revolution. The secretary nearly dropped his document files. But you cannot mean we can all hazard a guess to his identity. We have the successor from the crone's own lips. He... He burst into a great rolling laugh as he picked his way through the riot debris in the snowy courtyard. The place was deserted, but the frosty air was thick with rumour. The driver was waiting at the gate with the covered skimmer sledge. Doubtroyal snapped his fingers as he heaved himself inside. Another figure leant back in a mound of cushions. Right into our hands, blustered Doubtroyal, just as was predicted. She's dead, of course. I hate predictions, said the other gloomily.
Doutroyal looked startled. He turned to the driver. Thrift, whatever your name is, back to the academia now. The new Pythia won't want to be kept waiting. He burst into another fit of laughter as the sledge pulled away. The merriment echoed up through the walls of the silent city. Finally, it was drowned by a cry. The anguished shriek of a mother faced with the limp form of her stillborn child. It had begun to snow hard. The doctor looked like a kid at Christmas, Ace decided. He stood at the heart of a dimensional kaleidoscope, phantoms of walls shifting around and through him like smoke. The iron grid of the tower was block transferring in. He nodded in acknowledgement as ghosts of familiar objects drifted past. Clothes, furniture, a bicycle, books, a hat stand, the bicycle again, less battered. The old reality was slotting back together. The TARDIS. No pins, no glue required. The young Cronaut crew was huddled in a ring of reunion close by. The older ones, the released guards, were scattered, watching, ignored by their younger selves. What happens now? said Shonzi. I think you get your ship back, said Ace. But she didn't look at him. Oh, you'll be pushing off then, back home, she went on. Have you got a family? She turned towards him, but he looked away. I suppose so. There's always the grumblies. There was a pause while they dodged the part of the portrait of the Arnolfini marriage that drifted through between them. Ace nodded towards it with a half smile. It's the doctor's, she said. He picks up the weirdest stuff and carts it everywhere with him. It's from the Flemish school, said Shonzi. By Jan van Eyck, what's left of it. There was an accident with the deletion chimper, the TARDIS told me. Come with us, she said. His face dropped. I can't, Ace, he answered quietly. There's no problem. The others can cope without you. And there's plenty of room in the TARDIS. It's not that easy. Yes, it is. I'll fix it with the doctor. She caught a painful look in his eyes, but he kept moving his head away. She guessed what it meant. Commitments, she exploded. Why do people always have commitments? Sorry. So what's the matter? She tried to take his arm, but he pulled that away too. That's it. Misery, misery, misery. If you don't want to come, just say so. It's not that. There was despair in his voice that bordered on anger. Then why? She was about to grab him and kiss him hard. Instead, she pulled back. Just wait. I'll talk to the doctor. Ace. He reached for her, but she walked away instead. The doctor scrutinised a panel of instruments that was drifting past. He was sure it had nothing to do with the TARDIS. The chrono telemeter, called the older peccary, from their scafe. The doctor nodded slowly and hobbled across to the captain. It's all coming back together then. The redirecting of the Artron power was the kickstart it needed. Thank you, peccary. A restoration, agreed peccary. He observed the huddle of young chronauts a little way off. In the golden light, Ryogus was lifting the young pilot onto his shoulders. Now that the Menti Celesti favour us again, we should make an offering of thanks. The other chronauts were eager to agree. Only their young Captain Peccary, his face cruelly scarred, turned away with a look of anger. Oracular vernacular, muttered the older Peccary. Next they'll be making blood sacrifices. The doctor eyed the captain warily. He still had questions that badgered his thoughts, but they had to be worded with extreme care. You don't believe in all that, he asked. Peccary shrugged. I go along with it. It's instilled in us from birth. But you really believe in a new order of Rassilon instead? I don't believe in the Pythia's regime of superimposed superstition. Is there ever a new order, Doctor? You're from the future. You tell me. My knowledge of ancient history is fragmentary, Peccary. My memories get a bit confused. But the time experiments are... Successful? Eventually. After many changes. And we become time lords. The doctor sighed deeply. 
Contact with the past is forbidden. But I can talk to you, Peccary. I think you understand why. The answer was perfunctory. My crew are just redundant possibilities now. Dead ends on a defunct timeline. He nodded to the group of young Cronauts. That's the real future starting over there. I'm sorry, Peccary. Your ordeals were not wasted. We're rid of the process for good. Peccary glanced across to the scattered members of his own crew as they waited. We all hear you, Doctor. There are no recriminations. We die for the others to live and return home. The slow coagulation of dimensions intensified around them. The air hummed with power. The Doctor felt his own assurance grow, but his chances were running out. Not long, said Peccary, and he was suddenly in earnest. Tell me what happens in the future, Doctor. The Doctor sniffed. It's not all bouquets. There are a multitude of scientific triumphs, but also great wars. The telepathy dwindles. Death is all but abolished. The men get taller, or is it the women shorter? But you are right, Peccary. Rassilon and his followers come to power. Even if there are fearsome obstacles to surmount and a terrible price to pay. It's all in the legends. It was useless to ask his questions of Peccary. The captain and his crew should come to an end reassured. That was more important. Yet the doctor might never have another chance. There were questions he should have asked the sisterhood on Khan had he thought of it, or that wretched sorceress Painfort. But they were pale shadows of their Pythian forebears. Tell me who you are, said Peccary. Ah, the doctor managed a smile. I'm a doctor, that's all. An observer with a degree in pantopragmatics and a nasty, suspicious mind. He ducked a low-flying carpet that nearly took his hat off. There was no doubt now that the area was closing in on preset parameters and interfaces. The ghost walls were cratered with roundels. The young Cronaut crew had already vanished in the miasma. Peccary, the doctor said, tell me about Rassilon and his followers. Professor, I want to talk to you. The doctor froze. Not now, Ace, he said without looking at her. Captain, she said, if the doctor agrees, would you release Shonzi from your crew? Peccary glanced in confusion at the doctor. Ace, the doctor had known this would be trouble. His twin heart sank. Human emotions were so frail. Hadn't she been through enough already? Oh, come on, Professor. Shonzi's clamming up about it, but I know he'd jump if he had the chance. I mean, you virtually chose him anyway. The TARDIS chose him, said the Doctor. Same difference, isn't it? She said knowingly. And I want him to come, Professor. Really, I do. But I have business plans, the Doctor floundered. It'll mean more arguments, more trouble, less room. He knew he was fighting a losing battle. Her eyes were wide with determination. I can't rescue two people as thoroughly as one. I'll watch his back as well as yours. Trust me. The doctor scowled. And you trust me too much, Ace. So? she said. He looked in despair at Peccary. I'm sorry, Ace, said the captain. Pilot Shonzi cannot be released from my crew. We need his guidance to get us home to Gallifrey. We cannot travel without him. The doctor gave a nod of undying gratitude to the captain. Ace turned away, crestfallen. Yeah, sorry, it was just an idea. It was a fine idea, Ace, the doctor said. I'm too protective. I don't allow myself many true friends. You couldn't afford to pay the danger money, she said with forced bravery. The area had shrunk to the size of the console room. Shonzi was standing in the TARDIS outer doorway with the other older Cronauts. The shapes of another ship's control area were visible beyond the door, but still in the bounds of the police box. Peccary gave Shonzi a fatherly nudge forward. Go on then, Ace, Shonzi said. Off you go. Idiot, she said tearfully. Just drive carefully, OK? The doctor watched her run to hug Shonzi. He felt a jolt in his stomach as if he was riding a switchback. Instead, Ace's arms were full of the skinny, mucky, ginger-haired urchin. She was startled and then cradled him tight. Go on, ginger scruff, she sobbed. 
Love to your mum and dad and your grumblies. Love you, said the kid and pulled away. Time, muttered the doctor. You are the cruelest monster of all. The older peccary was gone. His crew had ceased. The cronauts by the door were now the young crew. Goodbye, doctor, they called. Goodbye, ace. All of you, said the doctor, when you get home, cherish the children. They are more precious than you will ever know. Goodbye. The doors closed. In the air, the doctor caught the words, We travel. He slipped his arm around Ace's shoulder and hugged her tight. They'll soon be home, he said. In fact, they were home millennia ago. He turned her and pointed at a shape that was growing steadily at the centre of the floor. It was an angular mushroom, and as it grew, it sprouted a rash of dials and instruments across its surface. A glass column, filled with flickering lights like stars, rose and fell at its crown. And this is our home, said Ace, her voice half choked with relief. Welcome back, Doctor. He could hear a slowly rising whine of returning power. A tingle of anticipation fizzed in him. He leaned forward and ran a finger across the still-growing console panels. With an almighty whump, the furniture and fittings arrived. Not returned to their rightful places as if nothing had happened, but dropped instantly out of nowhere in a random and chaotic spillage. The TARDIS resembled more than ever the aftermath of an earthquake in a junkyard. Home. No place like it, said the Doctor, and he felt a certain wildness coming into his eyes with the rising power. That's what I need. Answers about home. <laughs>